come to the last night of our gospel meeting, and I have to tell you, as much as I'm missing Jennifer and looking forward to seeing her and, and at least my boys, uh, I won't see Jennifer and uh, her husband and little Cora for uh, a few weeks, but I'm ready to be home. Uh, at the same time, it, it's going to be a very sad thing for me to tell you goodbye tonight. Uh, as I said, I barely knew anyone here when I came. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I didn't know exactly what to expect. You know, we, as gospel preachers, we go to hold meetings uh, places where we don't know uh, what, what the reception will be. We don't know what the opportunities will be. But I want to tell you, I could not be more encouraged and built up and just so thankful uh, for the week that I've had uh, as what I have this week. Uh, I appreciate the elders so much. I appreciate every member here, uh, just your, the, the spiritual minds that you've manifest, the uh, excitement for the scriptures and for the truth, the way that you've been receptive to it, and the way that you have shown a genuine love for me, for one another. Uh, it, it's just been refreshing, and I, I cannot commend you enough. The young people that have shown up here every night, uh, the families that have been here, and uh, parents with young kids wrestling them, but they're, they're right back every night. It's, it's as it ought to be, but it is encouraging and it's refreshing to be in a church where things are as they ought to be. So sometimes you don't always hear that from somebody outside. I just want you to know what it looks like for an outsider. And it's, it's very encouraging to me. I, my only regret is that Jennifer didn't come with me. And uh, she's told me, I don't know how many times this week, I wish I was there with you. I, you know, uh, she's saying, you're having such a good week. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's really wonderful. Uh, Corey, thank you for the song leading. It's, it's been outstanding all week. And that has so much to do with the gospel meeting. Um, for all the families, thank you. I got to be with the Sa sweet Sanders family and their sweet kids tonight. And uh, that, was, that was encouraging. Got to spend some time uh, with Kyle yesterday and just talking about his work here and the gospel and uh, where he's been, what he's done, and, and what he and his wife, uh, you know, the decisions that they've made. And I'm, uh, that always touches me, and there's a special place in my heart for them and the work that they're doing. And I know that they're going to do a good work here. I know that you'll hold up his hands. And uh, the, the beautiful thing, and this is one of the things that Kyle and I talked about, is that, that in God's wisdom, his wisdom is brought out in a local church where there's not one person doing the personal work. There's not one person preaching and teaching the gospel. Everybody has a part. Everybody has a share. There's people young uh, families that have a wide network, what, much wider than what Kyle has now that he's uh, called a preacher. Somehow your network just drops out when you become a preacher. But there are people here that can arrange Bible studies. They, they have lots of friends, but maybe you don't feel capable to teach them. That's where Kyle comes in. Uh, there are families that are very busy and it's hard uh, sometimes on a moment's notice to open your home for a study, but there are older families and couples here uh, that have much more ability and time to have their home prepared uh, for a study like that. And I just say that because we need to keep in mind how local church works together with every part doing its share. And I see great things happening here at Jamestown. I look forward to the next time uh, that I get to be in your company and that we, we are able to be around each other. Uh, I, I want to uh, just thank all of you and again for the hospitality and of course, to the Davises for keeping me in, at their home. Uh, such a wonderful place to be able to stay. I didn't know I was going to have an Airbnb this week. <laughs> it was really nice, really nice. Um, I, I know that there's more that I need to say, but I, I do want to thank the visitors as well. Uh, we have visitors tonight that have been here just about every night of the week, and it means a lot uh, to the brethren here. It means a lot to me, and uh, I, I pray that you have been edified and built up and uh, that it's been helpful for you. Uh, to be here this week. Uh, I want to mention once again, as I did last night, uh, just in case anybody is able to uh, come out and, and see me in Kansas City, that we'll be having uh, the youth lectures, of which everyone is invited to, young and old, uh, but we'll, we'll be having those at the end of this month, June 23rd through 25th, Friday evening. Uh, we'll have a singing, and then there'll be two lessons, and then Saturday morning, there'll be two lessons, there'll be a QA, and a uh, then there'll be Bible study for the young men, Bible study for the young ladies at the same time, and then we'll have three uh, services and lessons on Sunday. So it's very compact, 
but it's you're, you're going to get a lot out of it, I can assure you. Marshall McDaniel will do an outstanding job. Make sure you let me know uh, somehow if you're going to be there. Uh, we we need to uh, we we want to have record of whoever's going to be there because we keep up with a lot of young people there, and uh, especially when you're away from your parents, uh, we're we're responsible for you. We want to know uh, your phone number and who you are and who your parents are and their phone number and all that. So. You know, sometimes we may be listening to uh, something on the radio, uh, maybe a, a, a pundit, a political pundit. Somebody makes an observation and we say to ourselves, I wish I would have said that. <laughs> that was profound. You ever, you ever experienced that? You know, you, you hear something that somebody says and you're like, I can't believe that person's not a Christian and they have this uncanny insight to how things are. And, and I'm a little bit embarrassed that I didn't make that observation myself. Well, that's, that's not actually uncommon. I, I find it interesting that uh, in the book of Titus, uh, Paul speaking about the philosophers of Crete, he's making a commentary on the people on the island of Crete. And instead of quoting another apostle, instead of quoting the Holy Spirit, in Titus chapter 1, he says in verse 12, one of them, a prophet of their own. In other words, this is not a Christian, okay? He said, this prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And then Paul said, this testimony is true. <laughs> he was essentially saying, I couldn't have said it better. And he said, you know, even their own people recognize that. But my point is that sometimes, sometimes people of the world somehow have an insight that we miss as Christians, and we shouldn't. We ought to be able to see it. Jesus observed this in Luke 16 and verse 8. He said, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. That was certainly true of the Jews. And I'm afraid sometimes it's true even of Christians, even of brethren. We need to be mindful. We need to, we need to see things as they are. And so uh, this happens from time to time where we see this observation and, and this, this comes up or it came up for me uh, in, in a powerful way back in 2004. And I know that many of you weren't here then. Stick with me. We, we will make an application you'll be able to grab a hold of. 2004, it doesn't seem like that long ago to me, uh, but, it, but it was, I understand. But in 2004, in August of 2004, a song was released on the country uh, uh, spectrum called Live Like You Were Dying. And, and if you're old enough, I know you remember that song. Even if you're not a country fan, I know you've probably heard it maybe at Walmart or in some store. It, it was that popular. The song was number one for seven weeks. Uh, Tim McGraw, why he didn't write it, he did sing it. He got a Grammy for Best Male Country Vocal. Uh, the words of the song, though, and it's probably rolling through your head. Um, I told Bo I was going to sing it solo tonight, but uh, and he didn't know what song it was, and he wasn't sure whether to believe me or not. But I'm not going to do that. I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with it. But the song, the, the words of the song, urges listeners to start living like they were dying, and and we can relate to that. Now the song approaches the thought from kind of a, a temporal or a worldly point of view because it suggests that we might go skydiving or mountain climbing or even ride a bull in order to take in all of the joys of life. And there's nothing inherently wrong with any of these things. It's just that these are probably not at the top of the list of someone who's conscientious of a judgment day and an eternal reward. That probably wouldn't be the first thing that we would want to do if we knew that we didn't have long to live. Now, to be fair, the song also recommends Things like finding time for our aging parents, being the husband that we ought to be, to be a true friend, to love with a sweet and a genuine love, to use kinder and sweeter words in our conversation, and even to read the Bible. But all of this, I think, is interesting because this is an observation about life that is very, very true. The point is that you will get the most out of life if you will live each day as if it were your last. If you will live more for today. And we talked about the text in Matthew 6 last night about worrying and, and sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Too many times we're living for tomorrow. And many times we're 
missing the opportunities today because we're thinking about or living for tomorrow. But I think about this concept of live like you were dying. You remember in 2 Kings chapter 20 and in verse 1, God said to Hezekiah, set your house in order for you shall die and not live. Think about that. Set your house in order for you shall die and not live. What does that mean to set your house in order? That's not vacuuming the carpet. That's not cleaning up or getting those things planted in the flower beds that you've been putting off. Setting your house in order obviously means that there is a certain way that we live or conduct ourselves when we know that we're going to die. What is that? What is that way that we would live? How would it differ from any other way of living? Well, first things become much more apparent. When we know that we don't have very long, the most important things would be so obvious to us and we would respect true priorities instead of temporal things. You know, the Bible teaches this same concept, the same principle. The Bible teaches that we are actually dying in the sense that we're winding down toward death every day. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, remember in verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. I know for the young people here, that's kind of hard to relate to because your outward man is blooming. You, in, in your youth, you are actually really becoming stronger and you're becoming more, uh, there's more vitality that comes with it, but that is all a process of fading away, unfortunately. The reality is the outward man is in a state of perishing. Even in your youth, when it is in the state of bloom, that is all a part of this process of the outward man perishing. And, And we all have an appointment with death. And with the judge of all men, it has been appointed for men to die, Hebrews 9, and in verse 27. And as was read in the beginning of our study, according to James chapter 4 and verses 13 through 14, we don't know if it's going to be today, tomorrow, or sometime later. We have absolutely no idea. So when we say live like you were dying, the obvious fact of that is we are. We all have a terminal illness. It's called mortality. We've all got it. When man was separated from the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, that brought about physical death, the outward man perishing for every one of us. And so what we're living for is that inward man being renewed day by day and being fit and prepared for a glorified body that will not perish. An imperishable crown is what the Bible calls it. And it's going to be the body that hosts our spirit. But yes, we're dying. We all have a terminal condition. It's just hard to be aware of that sometimes. It's, you know, you think, well, I feel pretty good, you know. We'll hear about somebody that's been diagnosed with, with cancer, or some serious, some advanced cancer. I've, I've heard about a couple of cases. Uh, as a matter of fact, on my way to the meeting uh, this week and just astounded, uh, relatively young people that that have been diagnosed with this. And and every time there's that thought of, wow, wow, that's just, that person's my age or that person's younger than me or or, that could happen to me. And and, and it kind of slows us down for a minute. I remember a number of years ago, as a matter of fact, it was was the year before this song, it was in 2003, uh, my best friend growing up, best man at my wedding, his dad, uh, known all my life, was diagnosed with with cancer, and it was fast, and and it was advanced, and he didn't have long to live. And Brother David Cook was he's a wonderful man, and he uh, he worked for the FAA, but he raised and trained horses. He boarded horses, and uh, everyone that knew him knew him through his his horses. And the local fire chief there in the little country town that I grew up in. He was a young man in his 40s, but he was good friends with David Cook, and he bought and sold and traded horses with David. And he was devastated that his horse trading buddy, 
wasn't going to be here much longer. The next week, the fire chief had a massive heart attack and died. David lived 24 months after that. You, you see, we, it's very easy when someone's diagnosed with something like that that we say, oh, yeah, you, you need to live like you're dying. But what we don't realize is we're all dying. And as a matter of fact, when, we, when someone gets a diagnosis and they don't have long to live, whatever that is, or whatever it might be, we might not either. That's what James, by the Holy Spirit, by means of James, is trying to tell us is you are terminal. You have to live like you're dying. So in verse 17 of that text, he says what you need to do is you need to live every day as if it were your last. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. You have an opportunity, use it. That needs, first things must always come first. But again, in order to live like we were dying, we have to realize that we are dying. Charles Spurgeon, denominational preacher back in the 1800s, he made an observation. He said, men have been helped to live by remembering that they must die. That's just a really well put way of saying what I'm trying to say. We've got to remember that we must die. Now, there are two reasons that I bring up this song. Two reasons why, why this comes forth. And that is because there are some very important things about death that we need to understand. You remember in the 39th Psalm, flip over there if you will. I, I don't have the verse printed out here on the slide. But in the 39th Psalm, there's something really profound here. Beginning in verse 4. He says in the 39th Psalm and in verse 4, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. Verse 6, surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. He's saying it is vanity. It's tragic that so many people think that they have forever. They always think it's going to be sometime far into the future. But he's telling us we are all frail. And it's not just those people that in your mind, well, yeah, they're really elderly. We're all frail. In the 90th Psalm and in verse 12, in the 90th Psalm and in verse 12, the psalmist says, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now, he's not saying literally that we need to put a number on how long we're going to live because we don't know how long that's going to be. But what he's saying is, I don't care if you live into your teens or you live into your 80s or into your 90s. In the whole scheme of things, it is going to be incredibly short. As you look back, it's going to be incredibly short. Number your days. Realize that opportunities are limited in that way. So yes, two reasons that I bring up this song. And, and the first is, the point of the song is that even from a temporal view of things, as the singer and the songwriter was looking at this, even from a temporal view of things in this life, it's more rewarding to live like you were dying. And the reason why is because we simplify our lives. People don't understand. You will live your better life if you will simplify your life. We don't need to be inundated by all the things we're doing. All this, all this stuff about multitasking, I'm telling you, it's a big lie. Yeah, you can do it. Wow, you ought to get a trophy. Most people can for a while. As we get older... We, we cannot keep as many things going in the mind at the same time. But you know what? It's not good for you. It has been proven scientifically. It is not good for your brain. People are suffering from anxiety and depression, as we talked about last night, because they have too many things going on. I grew up in the, in the 80s when, when it was so popular to see how little sleep you could get. You know, that was, that was a bragging ride. Well, I don't need more than three or four hours. Wow. I wonder what you're going to look like when you're in your 50s, you know? 
And it's not just what you look like. It's the toll it's going to take on your mind. All of these things, they're they're all just a big lie. Simplify your life. Do the right things well. And you're going to live a fulfilled, peaceful, happy life. And get that rest, by the way. God makes sure that we understand that that's an important thing. We're going to simplify our lives. We're going to live for things that bring lasting fulfillment. I've mentioned several times growing up out on a farm, we lived far enough out that in my parents' mind, you know, and gas was 22 cents a gallon, but oh, that was way too far to drive into town, you know, take the boys to play baseball, you know, play out in the front yard. But the thing is, life was so simple and so happy. There were so many things we didn't know about and we didn't need to know about them. The TV went off with the flag flying at, I don't know, it was around 11 o'clock or so. It was just incredible. And I couldn't appreciate it then until I see where we're at now. Simplify your lives. And I mean, that's, that's even, that's for anyone, just, just living life. But if this is true in regard to the temporal things of life, how much more true for the Christian who has an eternal view of his existence and a firm conviction of the judgment day? Much more true. That's the answer. Much more true. So the question then is, how would we live if we were dying? What would that look like? That's what I'm asking tonight. That's what I want to observe with you. What would it look like if you got a terminal diagnosis tomorrow? What would your life look like and how would it differ from what it's been this past week? Well, in Ecclesiastes 7 and in verse 2, The wise man said, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. Why? He said, because that is the end of every man and the living takes it to heart. How? The living takes it to heart by realizing, wow, that could be me. That could be tomorrow. And even if it's not, even if I live into my 80s or 90s, that's not that long. I, I need to change some things up. I'm, I'm wasting time. I'm not doing the most important things. Go into the house of mourning, he says. And so I ask you again, would your life be lived any differently if you found out that you didn't have long to live? And you don't have to answer it out loud, but you need to consider that. And that brings me to the second reason that I bring up this song. The second reason I bring it up is because When that song came out in 2004, it was actually released at the end of August. And so all through September, that song is being played. And on September 29th of 2004, I was holding a gospel meeting in Conway, Arkansas. My father-in-law, Brother Phil Arnold, who had preached for about 20 years at 84th Street in Oklahoma City, he had been sick. Uh, He had actually done the funeral for my best friend's dad, who had, uh, after 24 months of fighting it, had passed away. And he was so sick at the funeral that he had to ask me to do the graveside service. And we didn't know what was wrong with him. And so I left for the meeting. And on Wednesday of the meeting, uh, Jennifer called me while I was at lunch with one of the elders, said, hey, they think dad might be diabetic. And I said, well, that's that's not a good thing, but if, if they've determined that, he can be medicated, you know, that things can get better. So I went back to the house where I was staying and I was preparing. I was shortly going to be preaching that evening and Jennifer called again. And this time when I answered the phone, she couldn't speak. She was sobbing so heavily. One of the elders wives was there with her in the local congregation where I preached and she got on the phone and told me, that Jennifer's dad had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, the reason that it appeared to be diabetes. I knew what pancreatic cancer meant because my best friend's dad had just died from that. It was terminal. So Jennifer immediately flew back to Oklahoma City that night. I drove home that night, picked up the kids the next day, drove to Oklahoma City. We met with the oncologist the next morning, and she said maybe three months to live. Tremendously advanced. It's gone to the liver. He was 54 years old. He's a young man. 
He passed away eight weeks later to the day, Thanksgiving morning, 7 a.m. And what I saw over those eight weeks was a man who was living like he was dying. I observed it. And every day that I'd run and get something to eat for them, jump in the car, that song would be on the radio, Live Like You're Dying. And I realized this is what it looks like. And it made me so aware, because at the time he was 54, that seemed kind of old to me. (laughs) It wasn't, but it seemed kind of old now. (laughs) that Wow. And so it, it left me with the impression that, I've got to start doing some things differently. I've got to look at things in a different way. I've got to be able to see what would God put at the top of my bucket list if I didn't have long to live. And that's what I want you to consider. What would it look like? How would we live if we were dying? You know, as I began to identify things in my own life and what I would do, I I, I made a list. And I said, first... First things first, I would examine my life with a fine-tuned comb. I would be praying, and I'd be seeking. And if there was any transgression in my life, that's the first thing I would take care of. I would repent of my sin. And what I mean by that is I would take it seriously. You say, well, yeah. Well, I'm afraid that sometimes we don't take sin seriously enough. We rationalize it. Because other people commit the same sin, you know, yeah. I mean, I use words like that sometimes, but you know, hey, I, there's a lot of ways that we rationalize. Gossip, covetousness. Oh, that's so hard to determine, isn't it? It's really not. If, if we took it seriously, we would run the other direction. And that's what I'm saying. We would repent of our sins because we would take it seriously because if we knew that we were at the gates of that point of no return, our fear of the judgment would have an impact on us. In Colossians chapter 3 and verses 5 through 6, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire. That's pretty general. How many of us would be hit with that? Covetousness. Uh Uh-oh, he brought it up which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. We better be able to figure out what covetousness is. Because of this, among other things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And it's not just that person that is uber wealthy living in a giant house. As a matter of fact, it might be a very, very poor person. Covetousness is simply craving more regardless of how much or how little you have and and but I, I want you to see that is that fear of God that Paul is bringing up here that we need to be very mindful of in second Peter in chapter 3 second Peter 3 beginning in verse 10 he says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise the elements will melt with fervent heat Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire and the elements will melt from heat? Are you hastening that day? In other words, are you saying, hurry up, let's get here you're struggling with some things that you know you need to repent of, and you're going to. You're going to fix this. You'll get to that soon. Then you're not hastening today because you're not ready. You ever heard a sound, something that was out of place, and you thought, "Uh uh-oh. See, that's a good indicator that you need to examine yourself. You need to wonder, is this it? In verses 14 through 15, he said, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Yes, I would repent of my sins. And I'll tell you, I would stop compartmentalizing sin. Compartmentalization is a a very effective technique. It's very helpful. 
say for a, a, a man that is, is under a lot of stress at work or he has a stressful job and he's able to take all of those stresses and all of those things and he's able to put them in a box, put them up on a shelf and go home and let go of that stuff. That's compartmentalization. And you need to be able to do that. You need to leave those things behind. You need to be engaged with your family. But once we learn how to do that, that technique, we also can apply that in a negative way. And that is when we've done something and we realize, okay, the consequence of this is I've got to take care of this and I've got to go to this person or maybe I've got to take care of this publicly. Well, I'm not ready to do that. I'm not there yet. I'll, I'll take care of that in a moment. Let me put that in that box. And then a few other transgressions get put in that box. And what happens is that when we have that near miss, almost an auto accident, we have... Oh, we, we feel that chest pain or whatever it is. That's when the box comes tumbling down off the shelf and we're like, ah, you know, and then we go to the doctor and, oh, everything's okay. We sweep it all back in that box and we put it back up there. If you knew that you didn't have long to live, you'd get that box open. You'd get everything out and you'd check the corners of it. You'd make sure there was nothing left in that box. You would repent of it. That, I mean, that's just the way that it is. And so that when I say live like you were dying, I'm saying do that now. We don't know how long we have. And, and we, we're going to be held accountable for every idle word. We would realize the seriousness of our separation from God. In Isaiah 59 in verses 1 through 2, he said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Here's another dangerous thing. When we get accustomed to, to compartmentalizing these minor transgressions, at least in our estimation, we don't even realize that we've crossed a threshold and now there's distance between us and God. We might kind of know it, but we actually get used to it. We just live life that way. But when that near miss happens, when we get really scared, all of a sudden the distance between us and God becomes enormous and scary. I went through that. I was talking to you earlier this week about that time in my life, in my 20s, when I wasn't living right with God. I, I was going to church. I, I, I was doing it all under the wire. I, I, was, I was keeping these things hidden from my parents, but I wasn't right with God. It hadn't been for some time. I was living in Dallas, Fort Worth, but I was back home for the holidays. And I, I remember the day that my brother and sister-in-law and I were all going to leave and head back to Dallas, Fort Worth. I had been in Oklahoma City seeing some friends. I was coming back. My mom had been returning gifts with my sister-in-law. And I was running a little bit late. And as I was coming back on a two-lane highway on the way to my parents' house, I came up on a terrible auto accident. It had just happened. Police was just arriving. And I thought, I'm going to be really late if I get caught behind this. I need to get around it quick. And as I went around the car, I could barely recognized the car. And then I saw my sister-in-law in the bar ditch looking over my kindergarten niece. And someone was doing CPR on her. And then I realized that was my mom in the driver's seat with gauze wrapped around her head that was soaked in blood. And I pulled the car over and ran back and sat down next to my mom and held her hand really not confident that she was going to live with the amount of blood she had lost. And it was at that moment that I realized that my prayers would get no higher than the top of that car. I made a commitment that day. It was a turning point for me. I would never let that happen to me again. But my distance from God became so vivid and so scary. And that's the thing. If we live every day like we're dying, that is first and foremost that we are going to draw near to God, cling to God with every ounce of energy that we have. If I do nothing else today, I'm going to draw near to God in prayer, in praise, in His Word. And that's going to guide everything else that I do the rest of the day. But you see, when I've compartmentalized these sins, there's a separation from God. But I would realize that separation if I knew that I was dying. And I'll tell you something else. 
I would give up anything and everything in order to be right with God, in order to be prepared for that judgment day. I'd be willing to do anything. Yes, I would forget my pride. I would go forward and acknowledge that sin that needs to be acknowledged. I'd go to that person that maybe I've rationalized it because they wronged me too, but I would make right what I did wrong. I don't care what they do. I'd make it right. And if I've been putting off being baptized because too stubborn, didn't want the other person to think they were right, whatever it is, I'd be baptized. I would get that done right away. Yes, obeying the gospel. I would take care of the sin problem first and foremost. And that's what we've got to do every day. That's why the Bible says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. That needs to be a daily audit. We need to consider We need to begin the day. We need to close the day. Very close consideration of that and then have the confidence we ought to have. Number two, I would let go of petty differences. I would forgive my neighbor, my brother, my sister, and I would actively pursue reconciliation with those people. And the reason why is because There's something about death that all of a sudden relationships become much more valuable when we see their end. Have you ever had maybe a brother or sister in Christ that you've been alienated from? Something's happened. Your relationship has changed. You're not close anymore. As a matter of fact, it's awkward when you're around each other. You don't really speak. And then all of a sudden you get news that they don't have long to live. And it's an awful feeling, isn't it? I've had that happen. And you think to yourself, wow, was it really that big? I mean, should I have let this go on like this? I wish so much that I would have just gone over to their house and said, hey, I'm sorry. When relationships become so cheap, when we think we have a lot of time, We're going to outlast that person. They're going to come back groveling. They're going to say they're sorry. I'm telling you, relationships are so, so valuable. Don't do that. If I knew that I didn't have long to live, I would fix these relationships. I would take care of them. You remember in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 8, Abraham said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren we fail sometimes to, for, to remember how important that relationship is. The fact that I'm your brother, that cost the Son of God his life blood. How valuable is that to you? That person that you can't speak to anymore, that person that you, you have just the worst feelings toward, do you know how important that person is to Jesus Christ? Do you know how far Jesus would go to restore a relationship with that person? He would hang on a cross, writhing in agony, to restore the relationship with that person, and he didn't do anything wrong. They did. How valuable is your relationship with your brethren? I'm telling you, brethren, sometimes we look out here at personal evangelism as seeking and saving people who've never heard the gospel. Can you imagine the size of churches if the people who had fallen away could be restored? And how much time is invested in that? You know, the Bible teaches that we're to withdraw from those who, have, who have, are walking disorderly. But he says, don't count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Withdrawal of fellowship is not the end. It's the beginning of another process. And that process is everything we can do to restore them. It, all it does is it removes the social fellowship, but it does not remove the admonition and the love and reaching out. I'm telling you, I think we all can do better in this area. But if I knew that I didn't have long to live, I know that I would want to make sure that I covered that list of people that I would want to go back and say, hey, 
I want you to know I'm sorry. There, there's something here that I could have done better and I want to have a relationship back with you. And I'd be willing to let go because the reality is that a lot of these things are pretty petty. They really are very petty things that we allow ourselves to get caught up in. And, and there's the, the problem is that there's so many in-law relationships that this happens. And so many that, as I was saying the other night, where people kind of joke off certain things, people joke about in-laws all the time. And I don't like that. Read the book of Ruth. Ruth understood the value of an in-law relationship. When God tells us to honor our father and mother, when we get married, we have a double responsibility to do that. I'm to honor Jennifer's parents. She's to honor my parents. That goes both ways. And yet, brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws and mother-in-laws and father-in-laws and son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws, it gets so ugly. And so many family members are estranged from one another. I'd take care of these things. And the reason that this is so, such a powerful point for me and why I think it's so important is goes back to, to what really brought this whole concept up to me. And that is when my father-in-law was dying. You see, when Jennifer and I got married, I, her dad, he, he was a prince. He, he was incredible. But we were different. And we were both gospel preachers. We had a different approach. We had a different way of looking at things. We grew up differently. And I was that insecure son-in-law that thought I had to prove to Jennifer that I did things better than her dad. I'm probably going to get paid back. <laughs> and, and sadly, I, I did what a lot of son-in-laws or daughter-in-laws do when they're insecure with their mate's relationship with one of their parents. So I tried to tear down her dad in her eyes. I wasn't successful, I guarantee you. She's close to her dad. <laughs> and I'm glad I wasn't. But I'll tell you what I'm very thankful for is that God gave me the opportunity to sit at his bedside and to ask his forgiveness. Because he raised a daughter and he loved her in a way that she was secure with her relationship with her dad and thus it made her an incredible wife. She was secure with her relationship with me. She wasn't a man hater, and I owed all of that to him. And he graciously, <laughs> he accepted. And it wasn't that he was without fault. I mean, he, he wasn't a perfect man. He did things that got under my skin, but it was petty. And, and as I look at in-law relationships, as people talk to me about things that happen, I have to stop and say, is that really something to breach a relationship with? And, and especially many times it's between brethren, you know? God forbid. In Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 21, in Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 21, I want you to consider, Jesus said there, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you should not murder. Whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. What is cause, Lord? <laughs> you know, we need to think about that. Would we stand at the foot of the cross as Jesus is hanging, nailed there, and say, but do, did you hear what she said to me? Did you see the way that he looked at me when he said that? See, those are the things that we can let churn in our mind. That bitterness, man, that, that's, a, that's a powerful tool in Satan's tool chest. And we can convince ourselves that this was horrible. It was an egregious thing that they did. We need to come back to Calvary. We need to come back to the cross. We need to see what Jesus suffered to restore relationship with you and me and with everyone else and ask ourselves, am I angry with a cause. Would Jesus consider this a cause considering what he went through? And I'll bet we'll reroute. That's what we've got to realize. You see, differences are much more insignificant than we really realize they are. 
Sometimes, I remember an elder saying this, sometimes even when we're right, we're wrong. You know? I mean, maybe technically, as far as right and wrong, we're right. But the way we're handling it is just horrible. And that's what I'm talking about. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17 and in verses three through four, seven times in a day. If your brother sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Live like you were dying. Who do you need to see tonight? Who do you need to call? Who do you need to pick up some paper and write a note to or text? Thirdly, if I knew I didn't have long to live, I would be repulsed by things that are worldly and tempting, and I would see the danger in those things. In Proverbs 4 and in verse 23, keep, that word means guard, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. I'm talking about movies and music and social media and all the worldliness that's out there, the coarse jesting that we might laugh at on that sitcom, all of these things, we wouldn't want that in our mind. I remember as Phil in his last weeks, he was a classic movie buff. He, he had all of them on, on VHF at that time. And he was so sick, he couldn't get out of bed. And he said, put in, put in one of those movies. I, I just want to watch something. And so my wife put in, and I don't even remember which one it was. It was one of the old classics. And it started, started out, I mean, just minutes into the movie, there's a woman in a very immodest, low-cut dress. And immediately he turned away and he said, turn that off. Turn it off. So she turned it off. There were people out in the living room waiting to come in and see him. And he sat there for a minute. He said, I want everyone to come in and I want to sing. I want to sing hymns. He was so conscientious of expunging that image of any thought like that because he knew he didn't have long to live. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could approach worldliness in that same way? I mean, the Bible tells us that very thing, that we are to abhor what is evil and to cling to what is good. But do we? If we knew that we were going to die, if we knew we didn't have long to live, and that every one of those things has the powerful potential to tempt us to an evil thought and one that we cannot immediately and quickly get out of our mind. We would hate those things. We would want to be as far away from them as we could be. In Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 28, he says, I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I'd be very conscientious about where I went, about what I saw, I would not want that image before me. And ladies, remember Matthew 8, I mean, along this line of somebody looking and lusting. In Matthew 18, Jesus said in verse 6, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. You might, you might salve your conscience and you may feel better by saying, well, that's his problem. He's a pervert. And I'm going to tell you, God's going to hold you accountable if you're dressing in a way that is sexualized and that is going, has the potential to lead somebody into that kind of vision, that kind of thought, to see something that they shouldn't see. Yes, we would take those things seriously, whether it is what we look at or it is how we dress. And, and for that matter, men need to be very conscientious of the way that they dress. I mean, modesty is not a, a single uh, fasted thing. It, it goes for the men just as much as it does for the women. We all have that responsibility. And there are too many Christians that are compromising in their, in their entertainment, the music they listen to, the things that they get enjoyment from, the movies that they see. In Matthew 5 and in verse 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We've got to make sure that we are cleansing and purifying that heart at all times. 1 John 2 and verse 15, do not love the world or the things of the world. You gotta let go of those things. 
Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21, test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Again, this would be taken seriously, this worldliness. And then I would see temporal pursuits as insignificant as they really are. And what I mean by that is sports and a house and a career, and I've got a golf ball up there. There's nothing wrong with golf. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. But as we talked about Sunday morning, these things are meaningless in the whole scheme of things. And, and I would not be, that would not be at the top of my list. I mean, I'd pay the bills. I'd cut the grass if I was well enough, if I could do that. I mean, there's some things I'd take care of, but I would not be concerned about meaningless things. You know, I enjoy sports. Obviously, I've enjoyed NFL football lately, living in Kansas City. And, you know, there, there's some things like that that, that I, I do enjoy. But I can assure you that would not be something I would be doing or even talking about or thinking about if I didn't have long to live. My father-in-law, he was an avid college football fan. The day that he was diagnosed or the day that the oncologist gave us the prognosis and how long he had to live was the first regular season games. And we asked him, we said, hey, you want us to turn the football game on? He said, yeah, sure. We stepped outside to visit for a little bit. We came back in within less than a half an hour. TV was off. He never watched another football game in those eight weeks. We, we would ask him, hey, did you see the game yesterday? It's almost as if he didn't hear us. He'd say, was brother so-and-so at church this morning? That's all he cared about. He didn't even think about those things. And that's the thing. We wouldn't care about this. In Matthew 16 and in verse 26, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? All of those things we think we want, we're saving up for, we just got to have, none of that would matter. Colossians 3 and verses 2 through 4, we would constantly think on things above, not on things of the earth. I'll tell you what we would find time for things that really matter. Family, we'd have time. We would have time to have a Bible study with our kids. We would have time to study with our mate. We'd have time to, to pray often with one another and with brethren. We'd have time to check on brethren. We'd have time to help out at church on a work day like you were talking about having here. We would have time to share with others rather than spending on ourselves because what am I going to do with it? You know, I'm not going to take it with me. Ladies, you would not be consumed with what your house looks like. You would open it up and you would show hospitality. It's amazing how many things and excuses we come up with to not do the things that are simple things that really matter. What would be at the top of the list? You know, I was talking about brethren that have fallen away. How many people could we go home and write a letter to tonight that really do need to hear from us? And you know, that, that comes to mind because I remember in those, in those last weeks while he was still well enough, Bill had a notepad and, and a pen and he was writing letters to members of the church there at Southwest 84th Street not that it had fallen away, but that, that were on the precipice. Members that he was really worried about. And he wanted to let them know his concern. Those were sent out after he passed away. That's something that could be done. I'll tell you a really interesting side note to that. I preached this sermon in a gospel meeting down in the Houston area um, in 2021. And I talked about how I, didn't, I don't know who those letters went to, but I, I, know, I know two of the people that, that got a letter from him, but I know that, that he wrote those letters. And so went on with the sermon, finished, the invitation was offered. And so there was a visitor in the audience that would, had been asked, called on to lead a closing prayer. And <clears throat> I had known him for a number of years. I had studied with him when he was in high school before he obeyed the gospel. And... Um, he came forward to lead the closing prayer, and in tears, he said, I was one of those people that got a letter. 
He was close to falling away, and he's faithful today. We have no idea how powerful a little bit of time, a little bit of time, instead of watching that show, instead of searching for that on the internet, let's take some time. Who can you write a letter to tonight? Yes, we would see temporal things. All those pursuits is insignificant. I, I dare say we wouldn't even be involved in them. And finally, if I knew that I was dying, I would be prepared. That's what all this is about. I would get prepared. I'd take care of the sin problem. I'd take care of the relationship problems. I would seek reconciliation I, I, would, I would detest and I would run from those things that could take my mind where they shouldn't be and I would let go of this world and the love of this world and I would focus on eternal things. And as a result of that, I would be prepared and I would have the joy and the confidence that God intends for us to have. Yes, I'm sure that there would be some trepidation. I mean, what's this going to be like? What's it going to feel like? I, I mean, yes, death is the, there's the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, we, we don't know. So yeah, there is a certain amount of trepidation, but his rod and his staff will comfort me. And would you too? And that's where we need to get to. In Matthew chapter 24, in verse 42, Jesus said, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Be ready. Paul said in Philippians 1, 21, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Yes, I would have a joy and an excitement that I'm about to reach that promised land. In Revelation 22 and in verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming quickly. John said, amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. We all need to be there. And you know what? You could be there tonight. You could take care of everything. I, I know you say, well, I mean, how long can I sustain that? Can I do it tomorrow? You may not have to worry about it. Do it tonight. And tomorrow morning, wake up, do it again. You can break these things down into, into something that you can actually bite off and you can handle. Are you living like you were dying? That's the question. In James 4 and in verse 14 our life is but a vapor. It has been said that he who would teach men to die would teach them to live. That's what we're doing this evening. Live like you were dying. You will get the most out of this life and you will have a very different life. You'll have an immeasurably better marriage, better relationship with your brethren, with your family members, with your in-laws, with the Lord above all things. Are you ready tonight? Is there anything that you need to correct? Can we pray with you or for you? Don't leave here without taking care of that. Have you obeyed the gospel? You need to come believing in Christ as the Son of God. Confess your faith in Him. Repent of your sins. and Be buried in that watery grave of baptism for the remission of sins. You can do that tonight. Everything's ready. We're just waiting on you to make that decision Please do it right now as we stand and sing the invitation song.